Welcome to the Sword of the Trowel, a podcast of Founders Ministries. Founders exist for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. I'm Tom Askell. And I'm Graham Gundon. We are coming to you from sunny Cape Coral, Florida. You probably wish you were here if you're living north of the Mason-Dixon line because these guys have been slammed with snow and freezing weather and even some really difficult things that have happened in places like Colorado. We prayed for uh, folks there yesterday in our worship service and we'll continue to do so praying for churches in those areas that they might be able to minister in the wake of that uh, natural disaster. But Southwest Florida is a great time, a great place to be this time of year, Mm -hmm. and especially over the next few weeks because the weather will get better and there's a great conference coming up. Yeah, the Yankees have plenty of reason to come on down to Southwest Florida. (laughs) Speaking as a Yankee who's done that, right? Speaking as a Yankee from Michigan, that's right. Um, So Founders has a national conference coming up in just a couple of weeks, uh, January 20th through the 22nd. Uh, There still is space uh, for the conference. You can register. But it is filling up. Yeah, it is filling up, filling up quick. Um, So get in there. We're also having a pre-conference January 19th. That's actually at Grace Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. And so a little less space there, and and space is filling up. So you can register for the pre-conference also at founders.org. And that pre-conference will be you, and it'll be Vody Bauckham. And you guys will be talking about vocation. Or That's right. Calling. The call. And uh, yeah, Travis Allen will be joining us. We'll have a conversation after Vody preaches about a called community. Uh, I'll be preaching or teaching on uh, the called life and just this whole idea that every Christian is a called person. Sometimes we think of calling as only being um, ministerial vocation. You know, called to be a pastor, called to be a missionary. And certainly those are callings, but every Christian has a calling from God in, in various ways. So we want to look at that, unpack that a little bit, because it, it just dovetails into the theme of the conference, which is the doctrine of the church, militant and triumphant. And so I encourage you to come and be a part of that. If you can't come, pray for us. Pray for the speakers. We're looking forward to welcoming James Coates from Canada, as well as Conrad and Bayway and Bodie Balkum from Lusaka, Travis Allen from uh, Greeley, Colorado, Tom Buck from Texas, and it's just going to be a, a, a wonderful time together. So as God brings it to mind, please do pray for us. During the conference on that Thursday night, the 20th, we're going to have a ministry update dinner, and you got to eat dinner somewhere. So if you're coming to the conference, I encourage you to go ahead and register for the dinner. It's only $20, which would be a great meal provided by the wonderful folks at McGregor Baptist Church here in Fort Myers. And we'll just tell you a little bit about what's happened over the last year and where we're going in 2022. We got some ex- exciting things coming up. Uh, I'm really looking forward to announcing some of these in terms of what we've already got planned and then new initiatives that are in the works that we hope to be able to announce before too many more weeks. So the registration for that ministry update dinner is only $20. And then tonight, I'm going to be doing another table talk. So we did one back in December. This is an opportunity for the Founders Alliance members to send in questions, and we just have a conversation or a dialogue. You can pick my brain. I always tell folks, they say, can I pick your brain for a minute? So if you can find it, you can pick it. You know? So uh, that's the challenge is finding it. And it'll be just an informal time, uh, as we did in December. That is the 4th of July. Oh, no, 4th of January. It just feels like July here in <laughs> Southwest Florida. Like it's a slip of the tongue. Um, at 7 o'clock Eastern yeah. time. So that's tonight. You can tune in if you're a fan member uh, in the Armory. You can go to the Armory now, click on the little logo there, and there's a place for you to submit questions. So you can go ahead and start doing that. And if you want to be in on that conversation tonight and you're not a fan member, there is a perfectly simple solution to that. That's right. We would welcome you to join. We are so grateful for those that do support us. It allows us to do this podcast and other things that we uh, do with founders. We produce materials for churches and publish books and resources that we want to equip churches and church leaders to the best of our ability. And we couldn't do it without the faithful support of so many of our Founders Alliance, founders Alliance members and our uh, Church Alliance members as well. Mm-hmm. And one final announcement, and this one's uh, a big one. For the first time ever, we're announcing here that we are actually releasing a new podcast. That's right. This will be a podcast that is released twice per week. They'll be about 10 minutes long or so, and it is called The Doctrinal Component with Tom Nettles. And so it's an opportunity to be able to get doctrinal, devotional reflections from the heart and the mind of one of the greatest uh, historical theologians that, that the church has today. That's right. Yeah, Tom uh, told me a few years ago that he really wanted to spend the last years of his life 
just doing exegesis and exposition. Here's a guy who has given his life to teaching uh, church history, historical theology, and all of that that God has uh, put in him over the years now. He's just zeroing in on biblical exposition. And so I've listened to some of these, and they're dynamite. You'll want to tune in for this. So watch for the drop date of the doctrinal component with Dr. Tom Nettles. Well, today we are delighted to welcome to us some guests from Canada. Uh, We have Andrew DiBartolo, who is the teaching elder at Encounter Church, as well as Mike Thiessen, who is a pastor of a church just north of Toronto. And so we're grateful for you brothers coming to uh, be with us today because there is something historic, unprecedented happening in Canada that's going to go into effect in just a few days. And that has to do with this bill that we heard about last year called C4. So brothers, welcome to the Sword and the Trial podcast. We look forward to talking to you about what is happening there in our neighbors to the north. Hey, Grant, thank you, guys. Great to be on with you. Thanks for having us. So, Mike, you also are the uh, president of the, um, is it called the Liberty Coalition of Canada? Is that correct? Is that the organization? Yes, I'm the president of Liberty Coalition Canada. We founded this ministry uh, in January 2021 as a way to formalize and externalize the activity of the Niagara Declaration. And uh, I know you guys are familiar with uh, Joe Boot and um, he and Aaron Rock and Andre Schutten and myself uh, wrote a declaration on the freedoms of the church in Canada. And so Liberty Coalition Canada exists to try to help Canadians rethink about liberty in the context of uh, our moral authority as Christians to define and promote liberty. And we also try to um, help out legally. So we have partnership with Christian constitutional lawyers across the country to uh, defend individuals who are are being abused as our rule of law is breaking down in Canada. Mm. You know, I've uh, got a copy of that uh, Niagara Declaration. We'll link to it as well so folks can find it. Uh, Go ahead and tell us the website, if you don't mind, where this is located. Yeah, so the Niagara Declaration 2020 is simply niagaradeclaration.ca, and our website, and particularly um, dealing with Bill C4, is libertycoalitioncanada.com. Okay, thank you for that. I love the this document and the preamble. Let me just read a few lines out of it. It says, in view of various cultural culture abandoning errors and a broad decline presently inflicting and marginalizing the church and at a time in the dominion of Canada where our civil society is renouncing both in law and socio-cultural life its historic Christian heritage in pursuit of liberty without the gospel justice without God's law truth without scriptures flourishing without obedience atonement without the cross love without faithfulness peace without repentance salvation without Christ and a world without creational norms It goes on to say that it's incumbent upon the Church of Jesus Christ to set forth again the claims of Christ as King and Lord over all the earth. And I I love that uh, the way that this document at the beginning frames what is going on, a world without creational norms. Mm -hmm. Genesis 1-1. That's what uh, we've talked about a lot here at Founders over the last few years. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, I recently read through um, Truman's new book, um, "The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self," and in it, he makes the statement that the the culture that we inhabit today is, is really no longer a culture, but it's an anti culture. Mm. And in this Bill C four, I mean, you see that front and center. It's no longer a culture. It doesn't build things. It doesn't have positive statements or positive vision for the world. Rather, it tears things down. Um, and so. The, the very first few words of this preamble and this Niagara de- Declaration, I think, bring attention to that fact. So is there a relationship between the C-4 bill and the Niagara Declaration? Did one, what, which preceded the other? Uh, well, certainly the work towards this bill uh, preceded the Niagara Declaration. In fact, um, last year when, uh, I think, I think Joe began to pen the Niagara Declaration and we began to edit it with him in um, uh, 2020. And um, it was because there's great confusion in the Canadian church between um, 
a Christian vision of justice and liberty versus a socialist vision. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, Christians seem to be very confused between those two things. And so um, uh, the Niagara Declaration 2020 was written in the midst of the pandemic, foreseeing that um, Bill C-4 would then be implemented within the next number of years. And of course, it was rushed through our parliament in a way that is unprecedented, and uh, it's just utterly dangerous. Um, I want to comment on the preamble, if I might. The preamble of the bill literally calls our Christian worldview myth and stereotype. And going to that paragraph that you highlighted, I too love um, uh, how Joe and the Ezra Institute have helped us, many of us, think through creational norms. And um, listen to the preamble of Bill C-4. So this is law in Canada in five days. Yeah. So it has gone through parliament. It has gone through, so it's gone through the house. It's gone through our Senate and the queen has given it Royal assent. And this is what the preamble says. Um, it is based upon and propagates. This is conversion therapy. Whereas conversion therapy is based upon and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, including the myth that heterosexuality and cisgender identity, which is that you identify with your, uh, that, that your identity, your, your sex conforms to the um, gender or that your gender conforms to, to the sex of a person at birth, are to be pre preferred over other sexual orientations. So the, the bill is a pre, with the preamble of the bill, it says it is myth and stereotype to say that heterosexuality and that the birth you are given uh, in your anatomy or the sort of the sex you are given at birth in your anatomy is myth and stereotype. Yeah. So biology is uh, simply a social construct or biology does not determine sexuality. So I can be whatever I want to be in terms of gender, as it's so defined today, regardless of what God created me to be. So well, Andrew, it, it's even stronger than that because it, it's not just it's how God created you to be or his design for human sexuality is a myth. Right. According to our law now, that's mythological. Yeah, yeah that's that's just stereotype. It's that's, not even that. And if you. And if you think that's that to be preferred, that's wrong. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a, a direct assault upon uh, that which Scripture clearly teaches, but creation itself teaches. You know, mm -hmm. God made us male and female, and uh, that is a fact of creation that cannot be overturned by any bill of any uh, legislator in the world or throughout history. And yet here we have the Canadian government saying, no, no, no. Uh, this is now a myth, and for you to prefer cisgender, that is, a, agreeing with your biological sex, that, okay, I was, I was born biologically a male, and that's how I identify myself. Well, that's a myth to think that that's superior in any way over uh, transgendered identities. Uh, this is a direct assault upon the very Word of God and upon nature itself. So, Andrew, I'm interested as a, as a pastor, I mean, how do you – how have you tried to shepherd your people through this, preparing them for what's coming and then acknowledging, okay, man, in a few days, this becomes the law of the land. What, what do you do as a pastor? How do you shepherd a congregation through this type of uh, cataclysmic opposition to what God has ordained? Well, something that Mike touched on with the kind of awareness of what was going on culturally and the necessity for the Niagara Declaration is – this is not, this hasn't just come upon us suddenly. Like, it's not as if we woke up one morning and, uh-oh, there's a, an encroachment of the civil government and, uh-oh, there's an attack on traditional Christian beliefs. And so I think part of preparing our people has been awakening them to the realization that this is nothing new. I mean, there have been changes to the hate speech laws in Canada mm -hmm. for, for years now that have already signaled, there have been overtures kind of warning us that this is on the way. Uh, and so helping our people realize that this is how the civil government, this is how our kind of even legislative bodies see the church and understand the scriptures. And so part of what 
I've labored to do and, and we've labored to do at our church, even over the last number of years, is to disciple our people and, and say, I mean, this is coming for us. Yeah. This is, and, and I don't, I'm not a, right, I'm not a, the grasshoppers or helicopters and the microchip is the mark of the beast kind of guy. Like, I'm not that guy. I'm not chasing after blood moons, but warning my people and saying, this is coming for us. There is a growing disdain and an overt hatred towards biblical Christianity, toward the law of God and towards mm. submission and obedience to Christ. Mm. And so having warned our people saying, this is, this is happening, hate speech laws. And so where we are now and where we've been in the pandemic, right in the last two years, discipling our people, telling them obedience to Christ is costly. Obedience to Christ is difficult. It's risky, um, but Christ is worth it. Uh, it. There will be challenges. That One of the things we've been trying to build in our church is the importance of we are a family, right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians that the church, the local church is the field where God does his best work. It's the building where he builds together the strong structure. And so encouraging our people we have to support one another, protect one another, lean into one another. This needs to be the place where we can be safe, where we can bandage one another up, right? We're going to go out in the world. We're going to get damaged. We're going to take fire. We need to come back here and bandage each, bandage each other up, send us out again. And so I think the best way to be preparing our people is to crack their eyes open and say, this is happening. This is happening. And one of the frustrations here in Canada, and, and we've talked about this, countless times as, as, as pastors across the country is that so many predominant evangelical organizations and more well-known ministers here in Canada seem to have their eyes totally closed mm -hmm. and are in utter denial of what's going on. And, and the, 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 let's warn them that doesn't seem to be going on. And so that's, I think that's what we're trying to do. And what we've been trying to do is tell our people this is happening, like mm -hmm. this is really happening. You know, it's, it's interesting. I remember we were uh, revising our church's constitution and bylaws uh, maybe eight or nine years ago, and we finally finished it in 2014. And one of the revisions we put in was that marriage is to be between a biological male and a biological female, one of each. You know, we, and when we did that, some of our folks said, man, why, you know, that's so pedantic. Why, why are you using this kind of language? I mean, everybody knows that. And uh, we just – as elders, you know, we were trying to, to discern the times and looking at what was going on culturally. And then the next year, Obergefell uh, is handed down by our Supreme Court that says, oh, no, no, you know, anybody can marry anybody or anything, basically. And it was um, God's kindness to us to see that and put that into our church's constitution because there are cases now where churches are being uh, encouraged or people are going saying, hey, can we – be married in your church and of course churches want to be kind and say well yeah you know our facilities are available and they say great you know me and my homosexual partner want to be married or me and my transgendered partner want to be married and some churches are finding themselves in real difficulties so there's no you, you're not going to get out of this fight one of the things that we face some of the same frustrations you just articulated, Andrew, is some of our evangelical leaders and organizations in the United States have just said, you know, this is not the time. You know, this is not the time. These are not the issues to take a stand on. I mean, one, one guy said, you know, we need to save our ammunition for the big fight that's coming. And I'm thinking, you know, it, we'll be we'll be dead with a, a warehouse full of ammunition if we don't take a stand now. Yeah, and, you know, it's not even, it's not even purely about um – the persecution of the Canadian church here. Although I think that that certainly is, is coming. Um, but it's, it's also about the suicide of the Canadian society, right? Mm -hmm. This bill gets put into law. Um, I mean, that is death to a yeah. society, the, a, a society that, that rejects clear creation order, such as man, woman, families, um, a society like that can't continue. And so it's not even that you would fight against this type of ideology um, because it goes against what our our Christian religion believes and we need to protect our, our own. But rather, you know, we also protect those who are our neighbors who are not Christians. We, right. we love those who are our neighbors who are not Christians, and, and this is not good for them. This yeah. is not mm -hmm. good for the entirety of my nation who's buying into this. You well, know? it's another, what it is, it's another notch in the belt of the death cult. Right. I mean, this is just another step. This let's murder babies after they're conceived. Okay. Let's let's kill old people because they're an inconvenience to us. 
let's tell people not to actually get married and have kids. And if they do much, much older and maybe one, and you know what, why don't we actually encourage boys and girls to transition, which effectively effectively sterilizes them. And so this is just another way of Mm. let's actually, yeah, it is, it is suicide metaphorically, but, but like literally it is killing our own people. It is preventing life from continuing is preventing life from developing. So in the spiritual sense and in the physical sense, we are killing ourselves. Yeah, that's very true. Mike, uh, back to this Niagara declaration, you know, the, the fact that you guys have stated very clearly, you can't have justice without God's law. You can't have Liberty without God's gospel. And we have been hammered and I'm sure you guys are too, that man, we, we ought to do this in the name of justice. Look at how these people have been oppressed. And if we love them, then we want this for them. We want them to experience what we experience. And so in the name of love and justice, the, the church has been moved down a bad path to just basically be co-opted by the culture. So one of the battles that we face here is coming back to fundamentals and defining what is justice and what is love. Because, Graham, as you just said, you're not loving your neighbor if you roll over and let this bill be passed unopposed and then become law of the land without protests against it. That's not love. Uh, People might commend you and say, oh, aren't you kind and generous and loving, but that is not biblical love. So I've been trying to think about what are some themes to tie all of this together, uh, both um, to give your American listeners um, a, a, a visual picture of what's going on in Canada, and then also to address kind of some of these uh, lackings in the church. And um, I want to paint the picture for you clearly of how this bill came about in Canada. So this bill came about because the official opposition party, um, the conservative party of Canada, MP Rob Moore, stood up in the House and asked for unanimous consent to pass this bill. So that would be like a Republican standing up in uh, Congress and asking for every member of Congress to agree right now, right here, right in this moment. And then that conservative was received by every member of parliament saying that they consented to the passing of this bill. So this means every Christian conservative member of parliament, every um, socially conservative member of parliament Every conservative, as well as the liberals and some of the more extreme left parties, all stood and rose and gave unanimous consent to this. And you can literally see handshakes and hugs across the aisle. So there's not one politician in our country who was simply willing to put up their hand and say, nay. And then going back to the idea of the church, why is the church so confused at a time when you, you know, just as you mentioned, Tom, about defining justice. And I I think that really is the root problem for both our churches and our, our politicians. I want to connect all of these dots with um, one of my favorite verses in scripture right now. And that is Proverbs 28, one and two, the wicked man flees though no one pursues but the righteous are as bold as a lion. When a country is rebellious, it has many rulers, but a man of understanding and knowledge maintains order. And so we really feel um, with the, the initial penning of the Niagara Declaration, and then now with the formation of Liberty Coalition Canada, that both, and, and um, Graham, you mentioned it not, it's not just a church thing. Um, but our society at large, both our Christian leaders and then our churches and then our politicians all need to change a very simple habit. And that is to stop running away from conflict because you're afraid of people finding out your sin. So, so that's what happens, right? A, a wicked man flees, even though no one's pursuing him, because the wicked man is always looking over his shoulder going, if I stand up for anything good, someone's going to look into my life and then they're going to realize. And, and 
That's what our, our many pastors are doing right now. And that is what many politicians are doing. In fact, every politician in Canada is doing that right now, a elected member of uh, parliament. And we need to return to, yes, a, a very clear articulation of what is justice and, and Founders Ministries, along with the Ezra Institute and other organizations are helping us define that very simply as justice equals righteousness, righteousness equals justice, if I make a just decision, it is a it is a decision that will be right before God. And outside of that is human imagination. And we need to call both Christian pastors and who whoever out there in society who is in leadership back to being people of understanding and knowledge in order to maintain order. And and it's just desperately needed. And, and there's no way forward except the decision. It starts with the decision, I'm not going to run. I'm, and then it's, the next decision is, I'm going to really actually try to be a righteous man before God so that I can be bold as a lion. Mm -hmm. Well put. You know, one of the things we've emphasized here at Founders for many, many years, and uh, we kind of re-emphasized it about five or six years ago, is the importance of understanding law and gospel, law and gospel. And so, you know, we've got movements of Together for the Gospel, Gospel Coalition, and things like that that keep the gospel above all. That's another one of the slogans. And those things are not bad in and of themselves in the way they're articulated or conceived. But I think we need something uh, along similar lines of together for God's law or God's law uh, above all principalities because there is a God in heaven. He's the one who's created everything. He's the one who has ordained for us to live in his world for his pleasure. And he's the one who has determined what is right and wrong. And it's not arbitrary. It is a transcript of his own character. And so whenever we try to claim to be just in a way that is contrary to what God has actually revealed to be just and righteous, then we are actually rebelling against God and promoting injustice in the name of a false justice. And that's going on all around us today. And the world doesn't get that. The church should get it because we have a book. And if we would understand the book better and submit ourselves to it and repent where we've messed up and begin to proclaim this, then we can begin to engage more directly the responsibility we have to teach people the truth about the God in whose world they live and the world which he's given to us. And, and man, we've just failed miserably. And it comes right back down primarily, not exclusively, but primarily as a matter of first importance, these creational realities. That this is the only world we have. It's God's world and we live in it. Well, it's funny you bring that up because there have been, and I'm sure Mike would agree, a number of conversations with of ministers, other people in, in, in our country, in our city, and as we try to explain to them why our church is doing what we're doing. So why are we defying the way that we are? What's our justification for our stance? Or what's our justification for believing that you know, the Christian is to engage in the sphere? And, and you have these spheres of authority, these spheres of government. And as we try to explain that, we'll say, well, here's what we see in terms of the nature and character of God revealed, here's what we see in the law in the Old Testament, and then immediately we're cut off with, yeah, 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 but that's an Old Testament thing, right? That we we have been we've been plagued with an antinomianism that is now like it's in full bloom, but like the fruit is is ripe. Uh, yeah, but that's just the first two thirds of the book. Nah, uh, uh, let's we don't. What, what did Jesus say about it? Right? Paul didn't say that we can engage. Right. Right. So that. That's, we're fighting against that. So we would, you're right. In the world, we would expect lawlessness. In the world, but in the church, at the very least, there would be. A Andrew, we've lost you, man. Uh, something's happened on your uh, microphone, so we, we're not catching what you're saying right now. But, but sorry, you got me. Yeah, I got you now. That's good. And yeah. So you you would expect lawlessness in the world, but in the church, you wouldn't expect it. You would expect even something as simple as. Well, maybe we can learn from the principles that are taught in the Old Testament. It's not even that. It's just, let's just neglect that. No, no, no. This New Testament only. Right. And there are people who, who, whenever we bring up righteousness that is inherent in Old Testament codes, uh, they say, oh, man, you're a theonomist. Well, I'm not a right. theonomist. 
<laughs> I'm not a theonomist, but I do believe yeah. in the general equity of those civil ordinances, which our confession of faith acknowledges are to be right. uh, utilized. And so wherever we see righteousness set forth in Old Testament or anywhere, we say, okay, this comes from God. This is right and good, and we shouldn't uh, shy away from it. So let me, let me ask you guys, okay, so what, now what? You know, what are you going to do? What, what, are you, what are you calling on churches in Canada, not just Canada, but the United States to do in terms of uh, the, the inevitable uh, implementation of this Bill C-4, which now criminalizes teaching biblical sexuality? Well, what's, what are you asking churches to do? I'm so excited that you asked that question, Tom. We are we are specifically asking churches to preach a sermon. We are, we're calling it a biblical sexuality sermon Sunday. And we are asking people, we are asking pastors, faithful pastors to uh, preach um, any sermon uh, that represents and upholds God's uh, teaching for male and female or for marriage Um, and we are asking them to do that on January 16th, and we are asking them to do that annually every year, um, on the second Sunday after the, the bill C4, uh, comes into effect. We see this as a multi-year, um, battle. This is not going to be, this may never be over in Canada. This is law in Canada now, now, now to, um, now to go all of the way to the Supreme Court to challenge this as unconstitutional uh, is going to take time. So we are asking faithful men to preach from their pulpits on January 16th um, about God's good plan for male and female and his vision for uh, marriage and the cultural mandate and to do that openly And so in our letter, we've actually asked and suggested that if you are going to be preaching uh, this type of sermon on January 16th, that you would do that, not just privately and, and, and carefully uh, just uh, not let anybody know that you're doing it, but, but make it, make it public, share our link at libertycoalitioncanada.com. We've got a, got an entire page called bill C4, how the church should respond. And we are, we are overjoyed that some of Andrew's work has now been seen um, in the United States where John MacArthur is now joining us. So I want to, I want to let Andrew explain um, how now American churches are being called to join us. Yeah. And part of the emphasis, it's a twofold kind of initiative, right? And one initiative, like Mike has said, is to call on men in Canada to be faithful And to, you know, the example you gave about hoarding all the ammunition, what we're asking men to do is don't just, you know, pop up in your church on the 16th, pull out a couple bullets and say, look how shiny these bullets are. And maybe even fire one in the air with a suppressor on, like we're asking them to know, like load up the long, the long machine gun, right. And like, just let her go. So that's the first thing we're doing. The second thing we're doing is, is we're wanting to, to avail ourselves of, some of the connections and some of the uh, resources we have south of the border. So here in Canada, and we have no friendly media coverage uh, and we don't have any large evangelical denominations, uh, uh, organizations, nothing that's, that's been, you know, overtly supportive or that's been in agreement with our position on things. So we know that we have allies in the United States as you guys at, at founders, we've been, and you've been shining a light on this stuff by having James on and even James wife, Aaron and Joe boot highlighting what's going on. Um, you know, some of the guys at Christchurch and Moscow and cross politic, they've been highlighting it, James white, uh, and, uh, apology at church and, you know, John MacArthur as well, because of his connection with James Coates. And so we know that we have allies, we have solid faithful allies in the United States, brothers who have a platform, brothers who have an audience. And we want to be able to say, shine a light on this, shine a very big, bright American light on this and call people to understand what's going on, not just in the United States, but a lot of you guys have large Canadian audiences as well that might not know about the Liberty Coalition of Canada yet. So we're, we're calling on our American brothers to join us in solidarity because right now, and we want to emphasize the 
right now, it doesn't come at a cost for our American brothers in terms of being arrested. But when your version of the Equality Act works its way through, that'll be the case eventually as well. And so we're saying to our American brothers right now, even though the cost isn't the same, in solidarity, let's join. And in unity, let's together proclaim God's design for marriage and sexuality. And with the platform and with the position, shine a big light on it so that people understand what's going on up here. Yeah. Not only in Canada, but as a as a warning, as a loving warning to our brothers in the States saying it might be a little bit further down the road, right? You might be approaching the cliff at a slower speed and we might already be off the cliff in the water, but we're both moving toward the same cliff. So we need to be aware of what's happening and we need to expose it. Yeah. So that's the might, second prong. If I might jump into on, to what Andrew just said there. <laughs> Um, many Americans do not realize that Canadians consume as much American media as they do consume American media. So right now, Canadian media is bought and paid for by our government. Like they are, they are literally subsidized by our government that has done like in the last two years, our government has criminalized speaking out against any health mandate that they have promoted so therefore the media has not covered in balance any research about um any of the mandates and then now with bill c4 they they continue to be bought and paid for so their own canadian media's only option for lucrative business in canada is to promote a a, a, a radical liberal sexual agenda so when our American brothers and sisters actually take up stories and speak about these things and cover issues in Canada, their Canadians are so gaslit by Canadian media that, but many of them will consume American media that they, when, when, when American media pick up on something, it is actually very helpful and informed uh, uh, for people. Yeah. Well, that's well put. <laughs> Uh, Andrew, we've lost your audio again, man. So, uh, I don't know what's going on there. How about that? Oh, yeah, so I'm not sure what's happening there, but you, what you guys said is, is, is so good. And let me just tell you that uh, I think I shot you this in an email, Andrew, that I intend on January 16th to preach on biblical sexuality. And, uh, I, you know, I've just returned to a series on Romans, and so I, I, I don't interrupt my normal preaching plan very easily. I was talking to or dialogue with another pastor about this recently, and I think there's less than six times in my nearly 40 years of preaching ministry that I've done it. You know, 9-11 was a time, a hurricane hit one time, but I'm going to do it. Uh, this time and set aside the normal plan to preach Romans that January 16th and probably going to preach out of 1 Corinthians 6, 10, and 11 on conversion from sexual immorality and just uh, to, to do it for three reasons. This pastor that I was back and forth with, he says, man, I just hate to you know have anybody tell me what to preach or to go against what I believe the Spirit's led me to do. And I get it. I get it. But there are times to do this. And I've got three reasons in my mind. It might be helpful for other pastors who are wondering whether or not we should do this. One, th this is an opportunity for us to make a, a, a wake-up call to our own congregations. As you said, you know, we may be a little bit uh, further back from where Canada is and going over the cliff, but we're headed there, and uh, the cultures are not that dissimilar. And so this is a time to wake up our churches to what is here. It's here right now. It's coming in worse forms, and we need to wake up and recognize what's happening. Uh, secondly, this is an opportunity to give a very clear signal to our culture that we are people of God. We stand on his word, and we're not budging one inch come what may that we are not going to flinch in the face of all of the pressures culturally, and even if they come legally, and even if it, it costs us uh, criminally, we're going to stand on God's word regardless of what you try to get us to say or do or not say or do. And then thirdly, it's an opportunity to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters up in Canada who are facing this, and there will be serious repercussions in the months and and years ahead, and we just want to know, man, uh, we stand with you. We, we remember you. And on these issues of standing for Christ the Lord, uh, we are one. 
Yeah, you know, a, a couple things. First, you know, no pastor is in sin if on January 16th they don't. That's right. The Absolutely. However, um, I do think that the church has a particular duty to speak to this issue at this time, especially in Canada where no one else is speaking against this. Right. The government is all for it, and no other cultural institution, it seems, at least from my American perspective, no other cultural institutions are speaking against this type of thing. And we have, you know, some churches get nervous when they get involved in cultural issues or political issues. Like, that's not the church's job. We should just proclaim the gospel, and, and transformation happens in that way. Um, but, you know, our elders, we, we just had a discussion last week about our duty as citizens of the kingdom of God within the, within the church, but also our duty as human beings who dwell upon this earth that God has created, our, our duty as citizens of the nations that we inhabit. Um, if you look at the Noahic covenant, and Noah, Noah is given the command to be fruitful and to multiply and to, to, to take dominion. Basically, the dominion mandate, the cultural mandate, is, is given to humanity again through Noah. And in civil societies, civil governments then have a duty to protect life and to promote the family. Amen. And Canada is doing the exact, the, the, the government there in Canada is doing the exact mm-hmm. opposite of that. And no one, else, no one is speaking against it but the church. Yeah. And so... January 16th is a great opportunity for churches in Canada to be able to proclaim the truth um, in this moment, and then also for churches in in the U.S. to stand with their Canadian brothers. Amen. And if you're listening to the podcast and uh, you're a pastor and you're going to join in on January 16th to preach a message on biblical sexuality, would you just leave a comment to that effect and make it known? Share this podcast so that others might uh, be awakened to what's going on and perhaps join in and showing uh, unity with our brothers and sisters in Canada. Well, men, Andrew, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we, we pray for you guys. We have prayed for you. We'll continue to pray for you. Thank and you. we want to do whatever we can to uh, just acknowledge that your stand for Jesus Christ as Lord over Canada, as well as United States and every nation, is right. It's good. And we want to support you and uh, be an encouragement to you any way that we can. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for having us. And, and what a great opportunity we have to proclaim the gospel in this time. Yeah. You know, you gave three reasons. And if I could bold, be so bold, I'll add one more. And that is, if we do not preach the word to our nation, they cannot be saved. Amen. And so this is salvation for those struggling with uh, sexual perversions. And this is salvation for those who are denying and hating their own bodies. We we proclaim the Lordship of Christ in order that they might find their Redeemer. So Amen. thank you for having us, guys. Amen. You bet. Hey, can y'all hang around for a few minutes? And we'd like to have a, a, a more intimate, personal conversation with you, if you don't mind, that we will make available to uh, those who are our, our Founders Alliance members in the Army. Can y'all do that? Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you for joining us on the Sword and the Trial today. We look forward to hopefully seeing you here in a few weeks for the National Founders Conference in Southwest Florida.